Um, hello. Yeah. If you came here expecting to hear Indian's talk, you'll be disappointed. Um, he bailed out, so I left it on me. And yesterday when I was asking Seb, he said it will be a small group. So thank you for turning up in large numbers. And, and I just found out five minutes ago it's being recorded. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for the encouragement. Um, so, yeah, so for this, so of course, with last minute presentations, we will, uh, since I didn't know what else to talk about, so we'll talk about practical tips on front end optimization. Um, if you do not believe websites should be fast, I think my talk would be pretty non interesting. Um, and uh, my aim is to show you that it's sufficiently complicated, so you should um, leave it to companies like um, Deck Secure or Cloudflare, et cetera. Um, or if you're not impressed by the presentation, at least subscribe to Cloudflare since they're hosting the talk. Um, <clears throat> so if you believe in this slide, you'd, you can just walk out of the meetup, go to decksecure.com, subscribe to them, and never worry about performance again. However, if your infrastructure is based on a relational database we, and you use a lot of joins on the fly, we can't help you. <laughs> Um, just rewrite your backend. Um, don't talk to me about that. Um, okay, so this is a very non-exhaustive list, but um, if you want to optimize a website, you can, I mean, apart from the backend stuff, if you want to do front-end optimization, either you can reduce the network-related times, like time to first byte, et cetera, or you can make the rendering of the page content itself faster. So uh, Google Dev blog post has a lot of good content on, on how different content types are blocking, et cetera, and you want to make sure that the first render shows you something, shows you colors, et cetera. And of course, you can make the loading of assets faster, so um, yeah, your web page is not without images for a long period of time. So yeah, the first obvious thing which you must be doing is either use a CDN, and I found out today that Seb is presenting his hybrid CDN, so of course, since he's hosting the, the event, so subscribe to Seb's awesome service, or you can subscribe to Cloudflare. Uh, DeckSecure works on top of both CloudFront and Cloudflare. I would also like to mention Akamai, Fastly, or if you are really adventurous and don't think any of these is good, you can use your own DIY one-ish setup. Um, there are many people who do do this. Okay, so I didn't have much to talk about on the network side, so now let's try um, the, so you should be removing the render blocking parts of HTML JS. So whenever a web page loads, the CSS is actually render blocking because it determines how the content would look like. And you want to have as little render blocking stuff as possible. So you want to get all your CSS files and your HTML files to the client as soon as possible to optimize the time to first render. Um, okay, so uh, do you think this, uh, this CSS import will, is blocking or non-blocking? Okay, raise your hands if you think it's blocking and non-blocking. There's nothing in between. You can either have to choose one or the other. So yeah, of course this is blocking because, um, because you didn't put a media type. How about this, is this blocking or non-blocking? Anyone on the side of non-blocking? Cool, yeah, it's, this is also blocking because it is actually indistinguishable from this one. Okay, let's try this. Is this blocking or non-blocking? Um, uh, how about if I open this on, um, on a browser which has width greater than height? Is this blocking or non-blocking? So yeah, this will be blocking so one, this will wait till the page has loaded and it will be blocking only if your uh, orientation is portrait. So you always want to put media queries on your CSS when you are importing them so that uh, yeah, you don't end up waiting for a lot of stuff which you don't end up using. So again, uh, this is a very good example. I doubt anybody uses it, but uh, if you are printing a page, then, yeah, then use something like this because um, yeah, this will not be blocking if you are just viewing the page. Though if you are using style sheets to print, I don't know. Um, 
So um, what Dexsecure does is that it actually, um, one, we only enable this for very brave and forgiving websites, uh, but we do rewrite the HTML and CSS um, so that we can, um, we can remove the blocking paths, potentially remove some unnecessary CSS, reorganize the HTML and JS, et cetera. Um, I don't really recommend doing this because, um, yeah, like do, uh, rewriting your entire HTML would take significant time. But just be careful to use media types and media queries. Um, that should um, get rid of the basic problems. Okay. So now we come to asset optimization. So there are many types of assets, images, CSS, JS, videos, all the other crap, which we will not discuss. Um, okay, so let's go to images. So when you are serving images, you want to choose the right format, the right quality. Um, quality, is the right, um, quality is a generic term I'm using for um, the right compression parameters and the right size. So size is the dimensions. Maybe I should have put dimensions. Okay, so at least I hope you guys are doing this. So as an example, if you are serving images to Android tablet, then it should be a WebP because you're likely seeing it in Chrome. It has bigger dimensions. Desktop has the biggest. iPhone, wow, this, okay, this slide is slightly dated, but yeah, iPhone should be the smallest. And um, yeah, you also vary the format. Um, yeah, Firefox doesn't support WebP yet. So to do this is actually, if you use a CDN, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, most, CDNs, um, most CDNs let you cache um, the other content by a device type headers. So for example, in CloudFront, you would have, you have headers for mobile, tablet, and desktop. Um, I read up CloudFlow documentation. They also have similar stuff. So okay, let's see another example. So just, just varying images by device is usually not enough because uh, you also have to care about bandwidth. For example, if it's, um, if it's a small Android phone in low bandwidth or in areas where connectivity is poor, you still want to serve smaller images. If it's an Android phone with, uh, yeah, with a lot of bandwidth, then you can serve uh, higher quality. Also, um, also, you have to kind of keep in mind that the decoding abilities of every device are not the same. And in some rare cases, increasingly lesser now, um, the decoding a smaller image might take um, a longer time than, um, than a bigger image. And of course, Microsoft always needs to come up with a new format. Um, so if you are on Windows Phone, uh, you should be serving JPEG XR. I have tried to file bug reports to make them not do it, but um, OK, let's see. Did I miss something? No. OK, so um, people. Um, if you are still not convinced that you should be using a front-end optimization service, of course, you might be brave and you can say, I can do this myself. WordPress does this. So they re-encode your JPEGs at quality 82. Um, again, this is around two years old because, of course, I don't use WordPress. Um, but uh, life is not so simple because um, there are lots of images which look beautiful at quality 31 or probably one-tenth the size, while other images would have compression artifacts at quality 85. Um, the context is important, the viewing device, the network conditions, the viewport width, et cetera. And of course, the best format depends on the image itself, uh, which is a bit of a problem because um, yeah, you, you do not want to have uh, monkeys looking at every image and then deciding what quality to send it at um, for any significant size website. And of course, the receiver decoding capabilities, which would be the hardware, the browser, et cetera. OK, so I'll cover the most common formats. I just put JPEG XR for completeness sake. We do support it, but yeah, I won't discuss it in depth. So JPEG is supported on all browsers. It doesn't have an alpha channel, so it won't, you, won't see the, you won't see transparent images. PNG, again, is supported in all browsers. And despite what they say, it's not useful for opaque photographs. Uh, WebP is awesome. Um, with some conditions, and it's supported on Chrome, Android, Opera, etc. Um, so again, like if you are encoding JPEG, um, I would say use MOS JPEG. Don't go to libjpeg, turbo, etc. Um, you have to be careful about the quality, since this is the main parameter you would be optimizing. This is a, 
Yeah, let's not go into DCT quantization. Um, chroma subsampling does affect the perceptual quality of the image. And of course, progressive images versus non-progressive. You should, um, if you are hard coding this, then you should be using progressive images, unless of course the target device doesn't have a good decoder. And yeah, usually what works best is um, progressive with custom progressive scan scripts. Um, okay, so PNG comes in, PNG is said to be a lossless format, but again, um, um, since we are trying to uh, make things faster, we of course don't follow the rules and we make it lossy. Um, so you can quantize to PNG 8, which means one byte for each pixel and it's maximum 256 colors. I have tried to quantize it further, but that is only if you don't want to recognize the image. And uh, you can use P you can uh, you can transform it to PNG 24 by applying a diagonal blur, but um, oh. Oh, sorry, I did not know that this will be recorded. Um, okay, so the, prob the only problems with WebP in my experience are that it always uses Chroma subsampling. It is usually better than JPEG, so if you are serving to a Chrome and you do not want to use a third-party service, which you should, then you can just serve WebP. It supports alpha channels, and uh, lossless WebP is actually kind of useless, but yeah, it's similar to NGO, but offers better compression. Okay. So this is more fun. Um, so that is, the image on the left is the original image. Um, this is the JPEG image compressed. Um, wait. Shit, I forgot. Damn it. Uh, OK, so what was this supposed to be? This was supposed, this was supposed to be a 201K PNG. Um, so which one would you choose? Someone say the third one, otherwise, OK, fine. You would always choose the second one, because um, the second one is, no, Trump is for the one you will choose. So you will choose the second one, because you did choose Trump. Um, OK, I was told not to be political. Um, so OK, assume this is 201K PNG, and you will choose the JPEG. So as a general rule, if an image is a photograph, don't bother converting to PNG, just use JPEG, and assume this is 200K PNG. I blame Harun, he didn't fact check this. Um, okay. Oh yeah, so as you can see, you will see the, you will see different compression, I'm not sure if you can see, but you're supposed to see different compression artifacts in both the images. Actually, I found that in JPEG images, sometimes compression artifacts make it look sharper than the image already is. Anyway, the point is that for photographic images, use JPEG. Oh yes, this is correct. Um, Okay, so image on left, which one would you choose? No, somebody say the middle one. Anyone for the middle one? This is not fun. <laughs> awesome. Um, so okay, now why you are wrong? Because <laughs> one, uh, this, so any image which is artificial, which is not a photograph, which means it won't have a lot of colors, try to use PNG. Um, so here you see the, let's see the compression artifacts. So. Okay, yeah, of course, you'll use the right one. The middle guy was wrong. Um, there are compression artifacts in both, but yeah, uh, but the PNG overall looks better, and it's smaller size, 50K. Okay, now we come to chroma subsampling. Um, so chroma subsampling is actually a process that happens when you compress uh, JPEG images. Um, so yeah, hmm, which, so okay, um, so, so usually when you are trying to see what is the right format and the right quality to send, you always try to compress an image to different, sort of like an A star search. You try to compress it to different qualities and formats and then see what works best. So if you see that there are a lot of artifacts when you compress it, then do not use lossy WebP. Do not do chroma subsampling, since lossy WebP will always have chroma subsampling. Um, if it has some artifacts, of course, you use, um, you do not subsample chroma that much. If it has no artifacts, then awesome. You can compress it more. OK, now the fun part. Oh, it is correct. OK, so uh, which one would you choose? Actually, I also forgot which, what is the answer. But which, one you, <laughs> uh, but which one would you choose? Anyone for left? Wait, let me check the answer first. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so it is right, because the compression artifacts in both are similar. Even though this, this right image does look a bit sharper, but we'll forget about that. Um, it is smaller. Uh, yeah, it is smaller because you, again, you subsampled uh, chroma parameters more. 
Okay, how about this one? No, that is not a compressed image. That is the actual image. Um, I resized it so it doesn't look so. Well. Okay, so w what would you choose? See, again, it depends on the context. If you are doing a presentation and you don't want it to be recorded, <laughs> then you will choose this. But yeah. Um, oh, wait. Oh, shit. Actually, this should be PNG because, see, you caught it. Um, and this was a trick thing. And I should not have had this slide. Um, but anyways, you would use this one because um, because here Chroma subsampling introduces a lot of artifacts. And the reason why they are more, so Q100 and even for Q100 you see a lot of artifacts because this image is very dependent on color and color contrast. So um, yeah, Chroma subsampling matters. So set that parameter, don't just set the quality parameter. Um, I'm almost done. So again, um, if you are like me or like most of us and you are lazy, um, use some kind of perceptual metrics. So multi-scale structural similarity is something developed by someone at, in Canada, but, um, uh, but it actually gives you a good measurement of how different two images are. So if you are trying this yourself, then you compress an image, compute the uh, D, uh, MS, SSIM, SSIM, or DSSIM value, and then see how and then see how two images compare without having to actually go through every image. So for example, if I say that an error of 10% is acceptable to me, then you set that as a metric. But the problem with that is that, again, the error that would be acceptable depends on the image. So you are back to step one, um, which means the slide is kind of a waste. But OK. Um, OK, JS CSS. And this is when I was running out of time, so I compressed everything in one slide. Um, at least minify and compress the JS and CSS. And of course, this sounds simple, but when you handle a lot of websites, you realize that CS minifiers actually fail on, um, on my CSS. Um, so um, yeah, always use it at quality zero just to be safe. Mm, and yeah, this is, a good, um, this is a good table written by this guy to show that his CS minification algorithm is the best even though the parameters actually say that it is not, so it's kind of stupid. But okay, um, um, the, uh, somebody launched this new compression format called Broadly. It is awesome and it's supported on Chrome, but of course if you're using AWS CloudFront, um, some, they mysteriously remove the BR header from accept encoding, so then you have to write a lambda at edge function to insert that header, but then uh, what happens is lambda at edge has a long cold start time, so actually, even if the, even though the compressed asset is smaller, it ends up taking longer. Mm. Oh, the conclusion, you can use Cloudflare uh, uh, workers. But anyways, um, use, use broadly. Um, so if you want to test how awesome your website is, um, you can chase Harun. Where's Harun? So uh, he is a human browser. As soon as you pass him the URL, he will uh, launch a website on all different kinds of devices, on all different kinds of browsers. And he will tell you how optimized your images, your JS, your CSS is. And if we end up making it worse, all your complaints redirect to him. Thank you. Let me just show the. Oh. Just show the okay. so, so, guys, because uh, you know how patience is running low, like for example, Google, Amazon, Akamai, they actually about 10, uh, 2006, 2007, so over 10 years ago, they did studies on. Uh, what's the ideal loading time? And back then it was eight seconds because everything after eight seconds, 33% of the users would abandon the page. So uh, Google did new studies and now uh, based on uh, 2018 stats, it's four seconds. So for desktop, four seconds is the ideal loading time. For mobile, it's actually two seconds because everything above three seconds, most of your users are gonna abandon your page. So hence, Sorry, uh, I think we have to wait a bit. Yeah, no worries. So basically the, the goal of DexSecure and what the vision is, is to ensure that every website's website loads within, that's the wrong demo, by the way. Yeah, no, but it's Google, so Google do it. No, 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 take the demo I sent you on your, on your Facebook. So basically, basically the goal is that, yeah, chat. Basically the goal is that every website loads within four seconds, regardless of where the user comes from. Whether it's from an uh, old Samsung phone or from a uh, poor bandwidth background, the website has to load on a mobile within latest three seconds, on a desktop within latest four seconds. 
we've done about, in the last few months, we've got about 83 uh, clients, websites that we're serving, and we're managing each of them to load in about four seconds on a desktop, three seconds on a mobile. This is an example that we've done, we've done actually today, so it's, uh, it's, it's computing. Basically, it'll show a very optimized website. It's a company that does a lot uh, for optimization, and yet their website loads on a desktop in 5.19 seconds, right? Now, the goal for us was to make sure that it loads in four seconds. How's it going, buddy? Uh, it is undefined. Uh, come back to this later. Do you have internet? Yeah. Uh, um, what is the URL you want to test? I sent it to you on, on uh, Messenger, buddy. Yeah, just wait for it. Okay. Oh. Just wait for it. Okay, so this is going to be the last thing we're going to show. It's... Are you serious? <laughs> Nitish? Okay, try again. It's... Uh, we've done about 80 uh, case studies that show, and even Google launched the tool. I'm not sure if, you, if you've seen it. Uh, think with Google. It's, okay, so there we go. So this was a very, very well optimized website, and they were losing a lot of money. Basically, when they came to us, they said, we have a high abandonment rate, right? And this is exactly connected to the recent Google study that shows that even, so everything above four seconds, People are simply impatient. They're not willing to wait. And we've, our tool basically got it down to 4.19 seconds with a bit of, uh, can you, yeah. So if you go down, yep. so in average 1.13 seconds, now this seems little, right? But if you look, that it reduces the visitor loss by 20%, just at one second, right? It's massive. And this is a company that has 15.21 million views a month. So you can imagine what 20% additional instant traffic means for them. So we're talking about 15 minutes, refresh, 20% more traffic, right? So that's about it. <laughs> okay, so I'm passing on the mic. Yeah, okay, so thank you, Shubham and Chase, for the talk and the demo. Uh, we'll take a couple of minutes break while next